one hears the phrase weapons of mass destruction, first thing that comes to mind are man-made bombs capable of blowing up large expanses of land, bombs that would spread, uh, spread lethal gas for hundreds of miles, something dropped from a plane or mailed in a box to somebody's home. Let's expand that thinking, though. Understand the reality of what life and WMDs have become, because we are now faced with the possibility that something submicroscopic and within the human body itself can be turned into a deadly and widespread killer. It's always a pleasure to talk with the director of the Division of Medical Ethics at the NYU Langone Medical Center, Dr. Arthur Kaplan. Dr. Kaplan, great to see you again. This one really raised some eyebrows when I read this. James Clapper, U.S. Director of National Intelligence, Worldwide Threat Assessment, talked about gene editing, adds that to a list of threats posed by weapons of mass destruction and proliferation. Gene editing? Are we talking science fiction here? No, we're not. The good news about gene editing is... We now have techniques that let us change DNA letter by letter. So it's very precise, very accurate. This came out of work on something called CRISPR, which some viewers may have heard about. It's just a tool that basically allows scientists to, uh, more precisely than ever before, change genes. Now you can change genes in plants. You can change genes in microbes. You can change genes in animals. And you can change genes in us. Most of the uh, uh, applications are probably going to start in animals, uh, maybe a little bit in bugs that we could put into ourselves to help fight disease. But this warning is whatever you use that might be able to make a bacteria, let's say, uh, less likely to hurt us, could also be used to enhance it or strengthen it. So that's where the warning comes from. These are called dual-use technologies, things that could be used for good, and also be used for harm. That's what I'm talking about here with science fiction, because it sounds as if, and again, let's go off on, on flights of fancy here for a moment, because science fiction begins in fact somewhere that somebody is one day able then to take a genome, to edit mm -hmm. the genome, to reinsert it into the human body, and have it cause a fatal disease, and have that potentially be passed on, whether by blood, sweat, air contact. I mean, I know I'm yep. not going too far off, but that is possible here, yes? It is. So here's, we'll give you two scenarios. One is we could genetically engineer a insect, let's say a mosquito, let's say one that carries Zika or dengue and say, hey, let's give it a more virulent form of Zika or dengue, that one that just causes perhaps birth defects, but might even be lethal and use that mosquito as our vector, our agent, spread it out against the population and get all the harm done from a weapon of mass destruction. Another trick might be engineer up a microbe, put it in the water supply, blow it into the air. Since we've seen anthrax used historically as a weapon, and it's a pretty crummy one because it's not easy to disseminate, but pick something like the flu, make that nastier, give it to a population. So those are scenarios that are doable. Those are scenarios that we have to begin to think about and prepare for. Do we, as a developed nation, have a handle on this at the point to be able to stop this, be able to see it coming so that it doesn't happen? So I think we need to do a couple things. One, we need to pursue our lead, and we are the leaders on gene editing. There are other places in the world that can certainly do it, but we do it well, and so we need to be able to track and identify any sudden changes in the flu or in mosquito-borne diseases. Right now, we're reactive. I think we want to be doing surveillance and sampling. The second thing we need to be doing is setting up ongoing vaccine research so that we could quickly make a vaccine against some of these gene-edited things. That means not only identifying them, but having the excess capacity around to make vaccines, which we don't have now. Part of the reason vaccines are slow to appear is that it's hard to discover ones that work against diseases. But partly is that we don't have any excess manufacturing capacity. So even if you wanted to make these vaccines, there's no factory to do it. We need the factory. i got about 90 seconds left for the second part of our conversation. Again, a little bit of science fiction here. Years ago, there was a book written by Robin Cook that was turned into a movie called Coma, where they yep. brought people into hospitals. They put them into comas because they had body parts, kidneys, livers, hearts, that fit exactly what multi-million dollar individuals were looking for to sell on the black market. It was a frightening book and a movie back then, but we're still here, aren't we? Because if you're willing to buy a kidney, you can still buy one, but the black market out there is something that we never hear about, but it's growing every day. Well, I'm not sure you can do what uh, Robin Cook was talking about, but let me give you a real world example of that black market. In China, 
you can go online and say, I need a kidney or a liver transplant, pay a fee, and they'll say, hey, we'll get you a transplant within two to three weeks. Well, how can they find somebody who's died to give you an organ on demand? They can't. What they do is execute prisoners, take their parts, and give them to people who travel there for money. But people so also is, sell these, don't they? You have people, prisoners, whatever you are, who basically say, okay, I have two kidneys here, $50,000, I'm happy to do it. And this is where people are saying you're exploiting the poor. Yes, most of that goes on overseas. In the U.S., we know where the organs come from. You're responsible for making sure that they weren't bought from convicts or sold by somebody on the street. So you do have to know the origin of the organs. Other countries, not so picky. Are we able then, as America, and again, the bigger nations of the world, are we able to bring this under control? Or is this just something that, quite frankly, there's nothing we can do about it because it's impossible to regulate? We can do something about it. We can tamp it down. I don't think you can eliminate it completely. There's still going to be people who go to India and find some poor soul and pay them and get their kidney. But we could get the Chinese, for example, to knock off this practice of killing people in prisons. Their definition of prisoner is pretty broad to stop doing that. And the way you do that is you say you can't come to medical meetings. You can't get your articles about transplant published. There are steps we could take. I've been calling for that for a while. I think the Chinese want to be accepted in the international scientific community. So that's a place we could bring pressure. Let's bring the pressure. 18 people die every single day waiting for a transplant. The need for kidneys is very high. So we need to it's just frightening to think that your loved ones or you could be affected by this, and it's something that we need to focus on. It won't just go away. Dr. Arthur Kaplan, it's always a pleasure. It's never science hey, fiction. It's pleasure. science fact. Thanks so much. The gaffe that should cost Bernie Sanders any chance of becoming our president. That's in telling it like it is. It's next on The Hardline.